When the Sega Genesis Mini 2 was announced this past summer, I was so incredibly stoked. Right from Jump, Sega was including Sega CD titles, and that alone meant they were finally breaking away from their intense focus on the Sega Genesis a bit. It also meant that finally, some 30 years later, the Sega CD would get another chance to show off some of the titles that made it such a fun part of my Sega experience. The Genesis Mini 2 also had a bunch of games that were unexpected. Sega stepped outside the box and included a number of first and third party titles you wouldn't normally see on one of their devices. The crappy part is, is that it was a Japanese Amazon exclusive, which meant some countries couldn't order the thing, and even the ones that could had a hefty shipping cost added to the price tag. Sega did eventually announce a European edition on top of the Japanese and American releases, all of which hit on the same day, October 27th. For those interested, the build quality is just as excellent as the first Mini Sega did. But there is a bit of irritation here in the design. The North American Genesis 2 never had a slide switch for the power button. It had a push button. It's also missing the red LED power light to let you know the system is active. These are small things, but for accuracy's sake, they're worth mentioning. On the positive side, the six button controller is absolutely spot on. The plastic is a tad different, but it feels 100% authentic to the original, right down to that beautiful directional pad and those perfectly clickable buttons. The tiny box it comes in includes an HDMI cable and a power block so you have everything you need to play it, though it appears the European model is missing that power block. Let's go ahead and fire this bad boy up and go over some of its options. One thing that I really appreciate about this new Mini are the options Sega and M2 put throughout the settings and the software on the device. There are numerous little touches throughout the library worth mentioning. In Sonic CD, you get a choice of the US soundtrack or the one found in the European release. Switch the language to Japanese and you'll get the Japanese soundtrack at the proper speed. Thunder Force 4 has a standard and high speed mode that appears to alleviate much of the slowdown. Space Harrier 2 has the original arcade Space Harrier included with it, both bolstered by a new sprite scaling feature. Fantasy Star 2 has an easy mode now that makes it a bit more accessible to RPG fans unfamiliar with its gameplay. Truxton has a choice of the original Genesis soundtrack or one that resembles the arcade version more closely. Sega CD titles that needed the optional save cartridge to operate properly, like Shining Force CD, has it. Most of you Mini 1 vets will also appreciate the fact that most of these titles have their Japanese region variants if you change the language. On the majority of games, this makes little difference, but in the case of Streets of Rage 3, it gives you access to Bare Knuckle 3, a slightly easier addition, but it still retains some of the censorship, like omitting the area with Ash entirely. That's right, the entire level is gone, making the Western version the preferred choice on this device. As for the features of the front end, you can switch between a full frontal box art view or a bookshelf view that looks at just the spines of the available selections. You can also organize everything in a few different ways such as how much you've played it, by the year of release, or by simply alphabetizing everything. You also get a few added features like a 4-3 and 16x9 aspect ratio change a CRT filter that looks just absolutely awful, and you can change the wallpaper to something more to your liking or get rid of it entirely. One of the more impressive options is for the sound emulation. You can choose audio that more resembles a Model 1 Genesis or a second option that comes off more like what you would have gotten out of a Model 2 Genesis. It uses a selection from OutRun so you can hear the differences between the two you have to remember that both of these options are approximations at best, as the Genesis had numerous revisions beyond just two where the audio varied quite a bit. I actually advise that you try out both across a broad range of titles here. I find that some sound good with one while others come off better with the other. Neither of these options are universally better across every title here. 
Sega was wise to make the mode button on the six button controller act as a shortcut to the options menu, similar to pressing the reset button. This menu is where you have your save state features, software reset, and your exit back to the game selection. You can also control the behavior of the mode button in the system menu. Now that we've taken a look at the system itself and the options it gives you, let's move on to the software library. As you know, you get more than 60 games on the Mini 2 here. Some were expected, some were not, and some were brand spanking new. Afterburner 2 on the Genesis was an okay port of the arcade original. Of course, without hardware sprite scaling, the visuals are kinda rough and nowhere near as smooth or as detailed as the original. It's still fun though, if you like shooters fast and chaotic. Alien Soldier was a late release on the Mega Drive and quite the showpiece. Large sprites and some impressive animation round out a run-and-gun action title for hardcore fans of the genre. Atomic Runner is a fantastic port of the arcade game Chelnov. The backgrounds have many layers, the action is smooth and plays well, and it even sounds good. Think of it as a horizontal shoot-'em-up on foot, and you'll have an idea of what you're in for. Bonanza Brothers is an arcade port that is much more fun with two players. It looks like the arcade enough to be a fine conversion, but you'll tire of this quickly by yourself. I was absolutely shocked at the inclusion of Clay Fighter. Of all the fighters on the Genesis to focus on, this was the one. Awful visuals, terrible animation and gameplay that makes Way of the Warrior look like a Street Fighter contender. This should have been one of the Mortal Kombat titles. Crusader of Sinti goes the route of Golden Axe Warrior and tackles the adventure genre with a top-down perspective. This one gets compared to A Link to the Past quite a bit for good reason. The visual styling and many of the gameplay features definitely take a few notes from the Nintendo Classic. The US version of this is very expensive, so it's nice to see an official alternative. Desert Strike was an isometric shooter that you really needed a good strategy to play. You had to worry about getting more fuel and restocking your weapons in the field. You had objectives you could tackle in whatever order you wanted. I really enjoyed this and thought it was an excellent addition here. I enjoyed the original Earthworm Jim and I was expecting its sequel to show up. While not quite as good as the first, this was still a blast. If you've never played it before, think of it as a run and gun platformer with a crazy cast of characters. Both Echo the Dolphin and Echo the Tides of Time for the Sega CD are here. Both these games are essentially the same as their cartridge counterparts with upgraded soundtracks and some new cinematics. They are the definitive way to play these titles. Elemental Master was one of the biggest surprises of the list when it was announced. This is an on-foot auto-scrolling shoot-'em-up developed by Technosoft. Your weapons are elemental magic like fire, wind, earth, and water which you gain after defeating a new area. It's pretty average in terms of visuals, but I like the soundtrack, and the action is fun and challenging. A good one if you missed it back in the day. Fatal Fury 2 is a serviceable port of the Neo Geo original. It's downgraded in terms of presentation, but the gameplay isn't bad at all. Final Fight was one of the few beat-em-ups to grace the old Sega CD, but it was a really nice port overall. It has most of the content from the arcade and keeps the two-player mode. We've seen Gain Ground many times before and it's here again. It's an overhead run and gun where you have to either defeat all the enemies or get all your men to the finish line. It's a good game and a solid arcade translation. Sega needed to fill out the Mini 2's library with a fair share of their own stuff, so Golden Axe 2 is no surprise. It plays very similar to the first and had a memorable soundtrack. It needed more variety in the stages and enemies, but grab a friend and it's still a hell of a time. 
This one is a welcome addition. I always loved Granada and its overhead go anywhere shoot 'em up action. The stages are loaded with exploration and once you blast down your targets a boss appears, typically some massive machine of death with a ton of firepower. A great soundtrack rounds out a stellar package. Hellfire was a big surprise. When you think of the better shoot 'em ups I can't say I'd put it high on my list, but there's also a lot worse. It does have a cult following for a reason, so be sure to give it a spin. Air Zog's Vi was a baller choice by Sega because it's so underappreciated in its time. It's a real-time strategy game where you battle for control of bases around a map. Grab a friend and learn it together because the CPU can be merciless to newcomers. Awful US title aside, Thunder Force 4 here is a monster of a 16-bit shoot-'em-up. Graphics and sound that are god-tier, highlight this incredible experience. Full motion video games are typically on rails and don't give you a lot of choice. Mansion of Hidden Souls was unique in that sense because you could fully explore your environment. The pathways were on rails of course, but you could come and go as you pleased. If you enjoyed Lunacy on the Saturn, be sure to give this one a go. Before Contra on the Genesis, we had Midnight Resistance. Based on the arcade of the same name, this has a fantastic soundtrack and some decent gameplay. It's only held back by being a single player adventure. Night Striker here was only released in Japan originally, but it comes in English so it's still very playable. It's crazy pixelated visually, so it's nowhere near as good as the Saturn port a few years later. The soundtrack is solid though. Night Trap was a favorite of mine way back when just because my sisters and I could play it together. We'd write down times for the augers and play it back, trying to catch as many as possible. It was a good time despite the limited gameplay. If you have kids, I hope you can get similar enjoyment from it. Outrun is a port of the classic Sega driving game. It's nowhere near as smooth, but it still plays well. The biggest issue here is the darkened colors that don't quite pop as well as they should. If you're used to playing this one arcade perfect, it can be quite the step backwards. And then we have Outrunners, which has the same name as the incredible arcade original, but it's a port of just a few assets and little else. They designed this so it's always presented in a split screen, head to head presentation, which is just awful since the Genesis has no native scaling hardware. The end results are the trackside details are sparse and the animation is extremely choppy. This was a piss poor edition and I would have much rather have had Super Monaco GP. Fantasy Star 2 was a monster of a game at its original release. It was a fantastic RPG that challenged you from the moment you got into your very first battle. If you find the main game overwhelming, there is an easier mode here to help you jumpstart your adventure. To say that I was surprised by the addition of Populous is an understatement. This god simulator has you battling an opposing deity in your bid to rule the world. It's a bit simple by today's standards, but it's still fun to cause disasters like floods and sending your knight into battle and destroying enemy forces. It may have been a surprise, but it certainly wasn't unwelcome. Rainbow Islands Extra is a special version of Bubble Bobble 2, a Japanese Mega Drive exclusive. It has new enemies, but the core game is pretty much the same. Make rainbows, defeat bad guys, and jump to the top of the stage. It's simple but a solid adventure that really could have used a two-player mode. Ranger X has been overlooked so many times for compilations that I was so happy to finally see it get some time in the light. This is an awesome action game with great visuals, challenging gameplay, and a top-notch soundtrack. It's essentially a running gun where you have some backup fire from a secondary vehicle. You have limited flight abilities and you recharge your weapon energy by sunlight or similar sources of light. This one is a winner and a great one if you missed it the first time around. Ristar is a game that really feels like nothing else on the Genesis. It looks a tad like Sonic, but the gameplay is anything but. You jump and climb around huge levels that look great. I really dig the art style and the music is really nice aside from those awful voice samples. Platformer fans should love it. Robo Alesta is similar to the ultra popular Musha though the setting and story takes place in a radically different setting. I really like this one though, especially its wacky story and excellent soundtrack. The Rolling Thunder series inspired a ton of games in its day and part two continues that great legacy. It's challenging and it looks nice. 
If you are a fan of the original arcade Shinobi and Shadow Dancer, this one you gotta try. Sewer Shark was extremely popular on the Sega CD in its day. It was heavily advertised and ultimately became the pack-in for the device. The gameplay is real simple, just shoot the enemies and follow the navigation signs as they are called out. The video is rough by today's standards, but there is still an old school charm here if you enjoyed full motion video games. Shadow Dancer is a fantastic action follow-up to the original arcade game. I love that Sega went in a different direction with the home release. They gave us a game that had the influence of the arcade, but wrapped it up in a fresh package that really set itself apart. Not to mention it looks and sounds great. This one deserves its spot in every Genesis compilation, mini or otherwise. Sega did a great thing in remaking the Game Gear Shining Force games into Shining Force CD. It looks better, sounds better, and has additional content. It's long, challenging, and rewards you for beating both episodes. This was a great addition and makes this Mini 2 worth the price of admission all by itself. And here you get more turn-based Shining Force goodness with Part 2. This is one of the better games on the Genesis and one of the longest in terms of time you can spend playing it. This one is loaded with deep battles and takes some real thought to see it through. And I love the characters, visuals, and that great soundtrack. There's hours worth of adventure here for those with the courage to face it. The Shining series keeps on rolling with Shining in the Darkness. This was the very first game to carry the Shining name, and it was quite the different adventure. It changes the perspective to a first-person dungeon crawler with RPG elements and a pretty robust crafting system. You may feel there's too much Shining Force here for one mini, but this one really does feel different. Take a look if you enjoy exploration. Sylphide was a showpiece shoot-'em-up in its day. Wicked cinematics give way to some pretty impressive video backgrounds during gameplay. This is a great addition simply because reissues have eluded it for over two decades. No Sega product would be complete without Sonic making a showing, and Sonic 3D Blast is our first entry. This was a late release that uses an isometric perspective as Sonic collects little birds to open exits around the stages. If you played it as a kid, you likely are grateful for its inclusion, but for most of us, this is not the Sonic you're looking for. On the other hand, Sonic CD here offers up an adventure quite different from what we saw in the mainline series. These stages are huge, require thorough exploration, and gives you alternate timelines to consider. I love the music and the graphics to this, both taking advantage of the extra storage of CD technology. If you're expecting to fly through the stages at top speed, this will disappoint you. But give it a chance, look around, and play it like it was intended and you may just find something special. Do you like spooky stories, blood and guts, and creepy monsters? Then Splatterhouse 2 might just be for you. This is the direct sequel to the arcade original and continues the story of Rick and his burden of carrying the terror mask. You have the usual punches and kicks, but you can also get weapons to beat down your foes. It's great stuff if you enjoyed the first. I love the Streets of Rage series and part three is included here. There were lots of changes that improved the gameplay and made this perhaps the best playing of the original 16-bit trilogy. The only area of compromise came with its western localization and its love it or hate it soundtrack. Of the available Super Scalar style titles on the Genesis, I actually found Super Hang On to be one of the most enjoyable. Seriously, the visuals aren't as smooth as the arcade but they still give you a great feeling of speed and the gameplay is pretty much spot on. Arcade vets should find this one quite the solid home conversion. Paired with the included six button arcade pad, Super Street Fighter 2 is a great one to include. While I found the music and Special Champion Edition to be quite a bit more palatable, the visuals and gameplay are still fantastic. The Ninja Warriors will likely not soak up much of your time. While it does have a great soundtrack and is a solid arcade port overall, it's very difficult and the gameplay is overshadowed by other ninja related titles on this very device. It's a throwback to much simpler times. I didn't like the ooze very much at first. It didn't play the best and it was really difficult. But time and understanding eventually brought some much needed enlightenment and now I find it quite the interesting maze runner. Well, maze oozer I guess you could say. You need thoughtful progression to enjoy this world. 
running headlong into battle will yield failure more often than not. Take your time, strategize your interactions, and the ooze can be something quite unique. The Revenge of Shinobi is perhaps the earliest example of what the Genesis was really capable of. Not only was it a looker with a great musical score, but it wasn't based on an arcade game. Instead, it was a wholly unique sequel to Shinobi, with new settings, new gameplay, and an entirely new feel. And man, what a ride it was. Crank up that difficulty for one of the best action games this platform ever produced. Toejam & Earl Panic on Funkatron takes the original and turns it into a side-scrolling platformer. Earthlings have infested your once great planet and it's up to you to find them. I love how this had a difficulty for kids and had a two-player mode. It's still quite fun today. Truxton is a vertical shoot-'em-up based on the arcade original. This is a great one for its challenge and its fun power-ups. There's much better shooters on the Genesis, but this was a good early one that many of you likely missed if you came on board after the blue blur. The second Vector Man was a great looking game and quite the challenge. The hostile environments hold all sorts of dangers and there are loads of cool effects like light sourcing and morphing power-ups to mimic your foes. If you enjoyed the first one, this one is very similar in quality. Viewpoint on the Mini 2 is a case of fixing an issue only to reveal another. The original suffered quite a bit of slowdown, and for that, I can't say it was my favorite experience. M2 lessens that issue here, but now that it has been sped up, the difficulty is fierce, almost to the point of being overbearing. If you love a challenge, this definitely has it, but for many of you, this will be an afternoon of frustration, never to be touched again. M2 did a great job emulating the SVP chip here in Virtua Racing. It looks and sounds the part, right down to the dithered colors and jumpy frame rate. Of all the games to add some improvements to, this could have really been a special project. Imagine if they had made it a solid 30 frames per second to improve the gameplay experience. As it is, the addition is great for those of you that remember it, but otherwise, the old school 3D will turn off many of you. Warsong was a turn-based strategy game that could be said to be the forebearer to the Dragon Force series. It was called Landgrisser in Japan and has many sequels that unfortunately didn't see many releases in the West. The visuals are quite simple, but the gameplay is as deep as an ocean. It also has an absolutely killer soundtrack. Our first bonus game is Devi and P, a paddle-style puzzler that is an absolute chore to play in single player. The directional pad moves one paddle, while the buttons move the other. One catches the angels and the other attacks the demons. Things get fast quick and becomes virtually unplayable. This was clearly meant to be a two-player game, and it's much better for it. Play alone at your own risk. The original Fantasy Zone was never ported to the Genesis. That is until now. This arcade port is spot on in a beautiful conversion in both graphics and audio fans will absolutely marvel at just how close it is. Like Viewpoint, Space Harrier 2 is another example of fixing something only to introduce new problems. This offers up a what-if scenario of the Genesis being designed with hardware sprite scaling abilities. And the scaling here is so much smoother than before, and it plays so much better because of it. But holy hell is the sprite flicker an eyesore. It is absolutely vicious at times, nearly ruining any bonus the smooth scaling provides. And that there is likely going to be the difference for many of you. If Sprite Flicker doesn't bother you, this is a radical improvement in gameplay. But if that Sprite Flicker grabs you and never lets go, this will be much less impressive. They also redid the sound with similar results. The music is better, but the sound effects are notably worse. A double-edged sword for sure. The original Space Harrier is included as an added bonus, but the sprite flicker is even worse in that one. I love that Sega and M2 ported older arcade games like Spatter, but your mileage with this will vary greatly depending on your taste. This is an old school quarter muncher that takes time to get good with. Basically, you collect flowers on your tricycle while avoiding enemies. You can jump and push blocks to defend yourself, but the simple premise may be lost on many of you unless you played the arcade version all those years ago. Star Mobile is a puzzle game that uses stars of different weights on a balancing scale. Keep everything balanced to end the level. 
This is actually quite unique feeling and should do well with those of you that like these types of games, but I again question any long-term appeal. Like Spatter, Super Locomotive is a simple game. Keep your train moving while avoiding obstacles, enemies, and their weapons. Also like Spatter, it gets tough really fast, so I'm not sure how much replay value this is going to have for many of you. The premise itself isn't particularly interesting, nor is the presentation itself going to bring you back for more. Our final game is Versus Poyo Poyo Sun, a port of the Saturn-powered arcade original. This is just the two-player mode, but the conversion is shockingly close. Everything from the color to the animation comes off very nice and fans of the series should be really happy with it. It does have a one-player practice mode, but you'll need two players to get the most out of it. So now that we have gone over the features and the games, what's the verdict on Sega's second mini console based on the Genesis? Honestly guys, I am completely torn on the necessity of this product. There is absolutely no question the game list has merit. Shining Force CD, Crusader of Sinti, War Song, Ranger X, Rolling Thunder 2, and many others are fantastic 16-bit titles worthy of your attention. I also appreciate the effort that M2 put into the options and bonuses, the little fixes to certain games they employed, the audio options, and the Yuzo Koshiro front-end remix of the various tunes from the library really set up a fun and interesting product. But I also feel Sega didn't do nearly enough to make this product worth the well over $100 I paid for it, nor is the library the best it should have been, particularly when it comes to the CD games. The Sega CD had a great selection of titles, and many are missing here. It even omits some of the titles on the Japanese version because Sega didn't want to spend any real money on licensing the titles across other regions. To release a product that tries to celebrate the Sega CD's legacy and then decide its greatest games aren't worth any real investment is a half measure of profound disappointment. For you tech guys, it's also worth mentioning that while the gameplay itself suffers no debilitating lag, the device still has the slight sound delay seen in the first mini by Sega. As before, this is not game breaking, but you definitely notice it across just about every title at one point in time or another. Just tap the directional pad when changing options in certain games to see what I mean. I am also disappointed in the bonus titles offered here. While I appreciate the faithfulness of Fantasy Zone, that isn't exactly a system seller these days, and the rest of the lineup are forgettable games that don't offer much outside of a moment's curiosity. Games like Spatter and Super Locomotive are direct arcade translations that have not been tweaked for home audiences at all, so their old school difficulty is a serious hindrance and not something you'll want to return to again and again. And then there is Space Harrier 1 and 2, two games utterly marred by sprite flicker and poor sound effects. Why only go halfway on making them better? If anything, this only shows that Sega made the right call stripping the hardware sprite scaling feature away, because the Genesis clearly did not have the available sprites to make these kind of games look nice. This really sets me at odds on recommending this product to you. You can certainly tell Sega never meant this to be a huge deal. They used the one Japanese mold for every region. They didn't spend the money to get the important Sega CD titles. They limited the availability to Amazon and only shipped to certain areas. It's expensive, and what bonus software there is will not resonate with many of you. That leaves this mini as something I can only recommend to the hardcore among you looking for official products or an official means of owning rare games like Crusader of Sinti and Shining Force CD. For those of you looking to discover how wonderful the Sega CD experience could be, this is a swing and a miss on an epic scale. This English version has no Snatcher, no Popful Mail, no Lunar Series, no Dark Wizard, no Vi, no Road Avenger, no KO Flying Squadron, no Android Assault, no Rise of the Dragon, no Lords of Thunder, no Flink, no Soul Star, no Power Monger. The truth is, is that this is missing so much of the core Sega CD experience that this product should have been put on hold and only done when Sega was ready to commit to making it the best it could be. And as it is, it's only a taste of just how good Sega gaming could be. I'm Sega Lord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.